I want you to open up your Bibles to 1 Timothy, book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, and my message is entitled, Look What Jesus Did For Me. And of course, I'm kind of echoing what Paul said and thought. Now, beloved, several weeks ago, Brother Tom was sick on a Wednesday night. Uh, he had called me, and so I put together a basic outline uh, on this message. And then as I thought about it more, I said, you know, I'm going to develop it, and I'm going to preach it. It'll be a kind of a Bible study as well as a preaching and teaching to you. How's that? Look what Jesus did for me. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 12, and we're going to read right down to verse 17. Look what Jesus did for me. Paul's speaking, he says, Thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly, ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. How be it? For this cause, because I am the chief of sinners, because of what I did, I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now notice that verb, believe on him, keep on believing on him to life everlasting. Amen? Not believed, past tense, but keeping our belief in him. Verse 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And all God's people said what? Amen. We're agreeing and assenting to what he had to say. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the infallible word of God. Lord, as we look at the testimony of Paul here today, Father, I pray that you'd help us not only understand it theologically, but personally and practically in our lives that we apply these principles in our lives, that we understand them, Father, that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and not groan in disgrace like a lot of Christians will do when Jesus Christ breaks forth and we see Him again at the second advent. So, Father, help us. Help this preacher with feet of clay. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Look what Jesus did for me. Now here Paul gives a powerful autobiographical sketch and testimony of himself. And he does it as himself as Saul of Tarsus, beloved, before his conversion. In other words, as Saul the rabbi, as Saul the Pharisee, as Saul the religious man, as Saul who was the scholar, as Saul who was the leader, beloved. This Saul was deeply religious, but he was lost like a many, like, like a many, that's Italian, like a many, like many are today. There are many people who are deeply religious, but they are lost. Amen? And so Paul is speaking autobiographically now. He wants Timothy to understand something because Timothy, as a young pastor, has to go forth and pick up the baton now and start defending the faith. In other words, he's in the midst of the spiritual battle, and now he needs some encouragement. He needs to understand what his job is going to be. And well, I'm sure that all of us, many of us, beloved, can identify with Paul here. The reason he gave this personal testimony, young Pastor Timothy, was to give him some encouragement. All young ministers, and I don't mean just young in age, anyone getting into the ministry, you hear me now, needs encouragement to stand up against, here, the Judaizers who are bringing the law in and displacing the gospel, and also many false teachers and preachers who had crept into the church and were undermining the faith of a lot of people. As a shepherd, your job is to look out, not only just preach the word, but you have to look out for the souls of the people, amen? You have to be able to point out the error, point them to the truth, and do it with all long suffering. So Paul is trying to encourage young Pastor Timothy here because Timothy now is pastor at Ephesus. Now, John was the pastor at Ephesus. He got exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Timothy now is standing in his stead. Now, beloved, these Judaizers were preaching unsound doctrine. 
They were preaching the necessity of having to keep the old covenant law of Moses to be saved, and in so doing, what they were doing was corrupting the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, they were teaching that you had to be circumcised, which is the sign of the old covenant, as well as keep the new covenant. Now, that is an absolute uh, heretical teaching that the Judaizers had brought into the church. And, you know, it, it appeals to the flesh. And one of the reasons it does is because the more religious things you do, the more you're thinking you're ingratiating yourself with God. Amen? And that's why so many of these mainline churches, they have this outward facade of religion. Uh, they're deeply religious, Paul says, but ever learning but never able to come under the knowledge of the truth. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the real power thereof. And what does God say? From such, turn away from them. Get away from them. Real power, the real form of godliness must come from the inside out, not the outside in. Would you say amen out there? Now, if anybody knew that the law could not save, it was Paul. If anyone knew that the law could not sanctify you or change you, it was the Apostle Paul, beloved. Why? Because before he got saved, he was a strict observer of the law. And I don't mean just the moral law. I mean the ceremonial law. I mean the judicial law. I mean the civil law in Israel. Paul kept the letter of the law. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. No one, he was above his peers, uh, the Bible says, is what he talks about in the book of Philippians. So he was a meticulous lawkeeper, beloved. But as meticulously as he kept the law, it was never able to supernaturally change him or transform him. Would you say amen out there? Law can't do that. Listen, beloved, you can legislate morality outwardly, but you cannot do it inwardly. You can look at all the signs you want that say you don't do this, don't do that, but it does not change your heart. It takes something from the uh, supernatural, beloved, to be able to change the heart, amen, and make that law now come alive in your life because it's been written on the fleshy tables of your heart. Would you say amen out there? You see, Paul saw it was the gospel alone that radically transformed his heart and his soul and his spirit. It was the gospel alone that radically transformed his mind and his thinking. As Paul thought on it, he said, listen, it wasn't the law that changed my eternal destiny. It was God. It was the gospel that changed my eternal destiny. It was the gospel that changed my eternal standing before the living God. Would you say amen out there? So what he saw was that the law pointed out the righteousness of God and it pointed out the unrighteousness of man and showed him his need for a Savior and drove him to the foot of the cross so he could get saved. And now the law by the finger of the Holy Ghost could be written on the fleshy tables of your heart. Would you say amen out there? You see, he had a run to the gospel of Christ for forgiveness, and so don't we. Now, young Pastor Timothy, beloved, needed to know this so he could refute these legalists who were trying to replace the gospel with observance to the law of God to get right with God. Now, beloved, I, I say this to you because it's important. It isn't only for this minister. It's for all Christians. We ought to give an answer for the hope that's in us with meekness and fear and apologetic. We should know how to defend the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. We are living. I, I, I've been reading. I don't know why lately the Lord has put so much uh, on my I've been reading all these old textbooks that I've had. And all I can tell you, beloved, to surmise, surmise it, if... If they thought we were living in the last days then, we are definitely living in the last days now. And this is what they all say. Before the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a radical departure from the faith. Every man will do what's right in his own eyes. That sound familiar? Now this is what all the old theologians were saying. And beloved Paul knows that. The last days are very precarious and they're upon us. Let's know that in the last days perilous times shall come. And perilous times are here. And Timothy, as a minister, beloved, now has to stand in the forefront. And he's going to have to defend the faith. He's going to have to look for the souls of men. He's going to have to know the truth of the word, will, ways, and wisdom of God. He is the one now, beloved, is going to be at the tip of the spear. Would you say amen? So Paul uses his life as an example to young Pastor Timothy and also to us, beloved, of what Jesus can do for you through the supernatural power of of his spirit and of his grace. A lot of you probably ask yourself, what has Jesus done for me? 
Well, beloved, I hope by the end of this message you'll be able to look at yourself and say, Good night. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I exalt you, O God, for what you have done for me. Amen? Now, the first thing I want you to note, beloved, is the personal testimony of a sinner. I want you to look at verses 13 and uh, 15. Paul says, Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, thank the Lord, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That little phrase right there has been debated so much, beloved, but I want you, there's no need to, for it. I'll, I'll explain it to you quickly. The personal testimony of a sinner. Well, beloved, Paul knew that it was the gospel that changed him. Now listen to me. What was he saying to young Pastor Timothy? Well, notice, beloved, he's saying, Son, I want you to look at me. I want you to look at my new life, my transformed life. Look what Jesus did for me. And he did it not by the gospel, as these Judaizers are teaching right now. He, I mean, not by the law, excuse me, but by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The law did not change me. The gospel changed me. Would you say amen? You see, he wanted young Pastor Timothy and us to see what... Uh, that if God could take a formerly sinful man like him, and Paul had all kinds of sordid baggage in his life, and save him by his grace for his glory, then God could save anyone. And I mean anyone. That's why Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. Moreover, I'm sure that all of us cringe in shame like Paul did when we think of our own former self, beloved. Now, Beloved, think about before you got saved, the things that you said, the things that you did. You thought it was normal. You thought it was natural. But all of a sudden, your heart got regenerated, your mind got enlightened, your soul got illuminated, and you started seeing from a divine perspective, not a human perspective, and it filled you with shame and you cringed. You see, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation, all things have passed away. If they have it in your life, you're not a new creature. Now, don't you lie to yourself. The world is self-deception. See, a lot of people are lying to themselves today, beloved, because they're saying, I believe in Jesus. They do from here up. But they've not had a regenerated heart. Therefore, if a man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. Let me say it again. Notice that adverb. He is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. Listen, beloved, what's he saying? He's saying, I'm no longer the old man that I used to be. Paul's saying, I'm no longer that old reprobate that I used to be. Or uh, you can say, I'm no longer that old degenerate or, or profligate that I used to be. I, I'm no longer that lewd and crude and rude person that I once used to be. Look what Jesus did for me. He changed me from the inside out. Oh, beloved, if we could only understand the power of the gospel. You see, it's missing in a lot of churches today. People say, one, two, three, raise your hand, you accept Jesus, that's it. And they don't have a clue what it means to really be saved, what it really means to be regenerated, what it really means to be changed by the Holy Ghost. And so Paul is trying to teach us some things here, and he wants to teach young Pastor Timothy. But, beloved, once you get born again, I know myself, when I look back over my life, when I got born again, I'll never forget it. I remember saying to myself, how did I miss this? There's a world within a world that I couldn't even see. And as far as the world was concerned, I was doing everything that I was supposed to do. I was a hard worker. I've always been a hard worker, not boasting. Been a hard worker, try to pass it on to my children so they could pass it on to their children. I, I, I went and got some education. That's what the world said you were supposed to do. Okay, bought some houses, raised the family. That's what the world said you're supposed to do. And then I had a confrontation with Jesus. And that radically changed my life. There's nothing else I wanted to do but preach the gospel. We had, I, when I had my health food stores downtown, we used to have sidewalk sale days, and they'd close off the town. And uh, you couldn't drive through the town, and all the storekeepers would bring their wares out, and I had my, all my wares out there. And all I wanted to do was preach the gospel. And I'll never forget it. I got up on a table. And I'm standing above the crowd now, and I got my Bible out, and I'm preaching the gospel, all right? And I'll never forget my wife, Ellie, comes and says, Joel, people are lined up at the register. I said, you take care of them. And I just get pre 
probably lost $10,000 that day. I must have been crazy, right? But, but you see, beloved, something radically changed, amen? And this is what Paul is trying to show you. Timothy, do you understand that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it? Do you understand that? It is the dunamis, the dynamite of God. It is the divine energy of God that can change, and you have the ability to be able to do that. And so he's trying to give him his testimony. Now, beloved, when you get saved, I hope you can say, look what Jesus did for me. Now, I want you to note three things under this point, beloved. The first thing, the past deeds of the sinner. Look what he says in verses 13 and 15. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now by Paul's own admission, he states that he was incorrigible. By his own admission, ladies and gentlemen, he states that he was guilty of breaking all of the commandments of the Lord and all the commandments of his law that Christ forgave him of. He recites three terrible sins that he had committed. In the first place, he says he was before a blasphema. Blasphemous is the Greek word. It means he impiously insulted and dissed or disrespected the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It means he impiously reviled and slandered the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have someone I was talking to yesterday, and this person knows I'm a minister. And as I was talking to them, and they used the Lord's name in vain, and of course I'm trying to get this person saved, but he could see that that shocked me. It just, it just stunned me. And he said, I'm sorry, Reverend, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, listen, thank you that you're sorry. I says, you don't have to be so sorry you offended me. You be sorry you offended God, because thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for God will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's the one you need to be sorry for, because everything you're saying right now is being written down in a book. Would you say amen? You see, before Paul uh, used to curse and condemn the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and constantly and continuously he spoke evil of him. It was Paul's mission in life to do that with Jesus Christ, beloved. Why? Because he saw Christ as an imposter, that he wasn't really the Messiah, beloved. And so he thought nothing of it. He wrote about it in 2 Corinthians. He says, I knew him after the flesh. I once knew him after the flesh. I don't judge him anymore after the flesh. See, now I'm a saved man. I saw now that he was more than a man. But all I looked at him was with some other religious leader that came along and pretended to be a false messiah. And there's been many of them that were coming through Israel at that time. Number two, beloved, he said he was a persecutor. Notice, dioktas is the Greek word, and it means this, listen, one who ruthlessly punishes and pursues Christians. In other words, he hated all believers, beloved, with a vehement passion in his life. Why? Because he saw them as traitors. Paul saw Christians as apostates from Judaism, beloved. Therefore, his mission in life was to set out and try to wipe out Christ, wipe out Christians from off the face of the earth. He persecuted them. And let me tell you something, that's coming again in these last days. If you know anything about the book of the Revelation, especially Revelation chapter 12, uh, 20, excuse me, when Satan is loose from the abyss, the restraints that have put on him, beloved, are going to be removed, and he will attack the church of Jesus Christ ruthlessly in these last days. Right now, beloved, he's on a chain. He's kind of restrained. He can still tempt you and persecute you, beloved, but not like he's going to do in the last days. Thirdly, beloved, he says he was before not only a blasphemer and a persecutor, he was injurious. Hubristas is the Greek word. It means he was a very prideful and insolent and violent man who despised Christ. Despising Jesus. It means he despised Christians, beloved, who both delighted in treating them with brutality and destroying them. That's what that word injurious means. In other words, beloved, as I looked up this Greek word, it means he was an arrogant sadist. In other words, he enjoyed inflicting pain on Christians, beloved. How? By arresting them. How? By beating them. How? By chaining them. How? By executing them. How? By splitting families up. 
pitting brother against father and mother and sister and hauling them off. Paul says, I was injurious, and yet I did it as a religious man. I did it in unbelief. I was a persecutor. I was a blasphemer. I was injurious. That was me, Timothy. And beloved, when you look at all those crimes, those are crimes against heaven. Amen. I don't mean indirectly. I mean directly against heaven. And so, beloved, we see the past deeds of the sinner. But I want you to see, secondly, the powerful deception of the sinner. Look what he said in verse 13. Who was before I became a Christian, a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now notice the powerful deception of this sinner, beloved. But I want you to understand this. Paul's not making excuses here for doing all these dreadful things, beloved. What he's doing is just stating a fact so Timothy can have some encouragement and confidence and the power of the gospel to change people, to forgive people. Amen? So Paul is just stating the facts here. Now he uses the words ignorantly and unbelief. Agnoneo and apistia is the Greek phrase, and it means he really thought that he was faithfully serving God because to him there was no way where the boogeyman lives that Jesus could ever be God's Messiah. He could never be the Messiah of Israel. Why the Messiah of Israel? He's coming in as Israel ben David. He's going to conquer those pagan Romans. He's going to set up a Jewish aristocracy. And we're going to rule and reign over the Gentiles. You see, that's the problem of the Zionists today. Christian Zionism is an offshoot of Old Testament Zionism, beloved. And they looked at the Bible politically and physically and not spiritually. And that's what's happening today in the church of Jesus Christ. You know, most Christians are dispensationalists by default. That's the only thing they knew. They got in the dispensationalist church and they're taught and they say, well, that must be it. And they don't have a clue that that's the new, that's the new baby that came down the block in, the, in under 200 years. The church for over 18, 1900 years never even heard of the things that they're talking about today. But I'm not going to go there, beloved, because what I want to do is be able to move right along here. So he thought it was his job, beloved, listen to me, to in his religious zeal and utter spiritual blindness, he considered it his job, his duty to stamp out Christianity. You know, I thought about that. And oh, how Paul's life mirrors our own until Jesus also opens our eyes like he did to Paul on the road to Damascus when we get saved. Amen? Once we too blaspheme the Christ and Christians. You know what I'm talking about. You used to make fun of one of those religious nuts. You see, beloved, once we too persecuted Christians. I'm not putting that person in this position right now. You know, they're just too strict. They're too conservative. They're crazy. They can't have any fun in life. Once we too were injurious. We injured, let me tell you, not only God, not only Christ, not only Christians, but blessed be God, we injured ourselves. And yet we didn't know it. We were shooting ourselves in the foot all the time. But we didn't have a clue, did we? Until God, by His grace, by His Spirit, opened the spiritual darkness of our eyes and let some of that glorious light flood into our mind and flood into our soul and flood into our spirit. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, Paul understood this. The second thing I want you to see, beloved, uh, or the third thing I should say on the point number one, is the uh, present diagnosis of this sinner. Notice what he says in verse 15. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now the word chief is the Greek word protos. And let me tell you what it means. It means first in the line of many. If you were to go to Detroit right now and they make a prototype car, that means we're going to get all the bugs out of it, and then after they do, what are they going to do? They're going to produce more. So Paul says, I'm a sinner. I'm a protoss. He says, I'm first in the line of many. But notice he's saying he's first, meaning that after doing all this, that is in his misguided zeal, in his misguided direction in life, before he got saved, Paul still always considered himself to be the very worst and the wickedest and foremost of sinners after he got saved for doing such heinous things to Christ and Christians and also the church of God. 
the very institution that God himself built on this earth, beloved, so men could come to know the Lord, so men could be trained up in the faith, so men could take the Lord's table, so men could be taught the word of God. Amen? Paul is trying to destroy what God created. Oh, he was trying to destroy what God created. And so, beloved, his conscience seemed to always torment him. And I thought about that because I, I know a lot of us, even though we know we've been forgiven, we've been washed in the blood, sometimes Satan brings to our mind things, how did I do that, right? And you, you shudder. Hey, listen to me. Do you think Satan ever brought to Paul's mind all of these things that he did to Christ in the church? Do you think he did? Do you think he just stopped the day that Paul got saved? Beloved, it hounded Paul all of his life. It must have tormented him. You see, listen to me. He knew that God forgave him, but he had a hard time, like we do, forgiving ourselves. I can't believe I did that. What was I thinking? You ever say that? I do. I says, what in the world was I thinking? Was I nuts? And so can you imagine Paul, beloved, now an apostle and a minister of God, a man filled with the Holy Ghost, God has spoken to him. God has caught him up to the third heaven. God has appeared to him. And now he sees how heinous all this light has come into his life. And he sees the darkness and the shadows of his past. And he must have just, every day, beloved, I can just imagine Satan saying, you know what you did. God will never forgive you. And then he say that to you. How could God ever forgive you for that? So Paul's trying to teach something to Timothy right here. You see, beloved, his conscience always tormented, though. Uh, listen to me, beloved. Paul says that the reason, look at verse 16a, how be it for this cause, because I am the chief of sinners, that I did everything in ignorance and unbelief, I obtained mercy. Now notice, he still considered himself to be the chief of sinners because of what he previously and ignorantly did in unbelief, not what he is doing right now. A lot of Christians try to use this as a fulcrum to justify why they're going and living in sin. They say, well, look at Paul. He is the chief of sinners. That's present tense. Paul's saying is using the present tense to reflect the past tense of the things that he did ignorantly in unbelief. Amen? That's what Paul is saying there. You listen to me. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't live anymore. I don't do the things I want to do. I submit myself to God. I am a bond slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, all through the Pauline epistles, he tells us to live a holy and righteous and godly life in obedience to the commandments of God. Not go out and sin or fornicate and get drunk and do the things you want to do. That's not what he's talking about when he's saying... Uh, uh, that he was the chief of sinners. But that's what a lot of once saved, always saved people teach. The Bible never taught once saved, always saved. It always taught the perseverance of the saints. Amen? And those who persevere are preserved. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, so that's point number one, the personal testimony of a sinner. We saw the past deeds of this sinner, the powerful deception of this sinner, and the present diagnosis of this sinner. Secondly, beloved, I want you to see the pardoned testimony of a saint. Look what he says in verses 13 and 14. He says, Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. All of us ought to shout, Hallelujah! Glory to God! Blessed be thy holy name! You see, beloved, and he, he says, I did it ignorantly, and I did it in unbelief. Verse 13, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, even though Paul saw himself as totally unworthy of being forgiven and of being saved, beloved, even though Paul saw himself as being totally unworthy of being a Christian or a minister, he full well knew he was, and he could thankfully say, Hey, Timothy, look what Jesus did for me. Look at it. Just look. Did he change my life? You know what I was like before. Did he change my life? He, well, 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 yeah, Paul, he did change your life. Well, what do you think he can do for you? Well, what do you think he can do for the sheep that are under your preaching and under your teaching? What do you think he can do for them? Amen. You listen to me, beloved. Can you say this? Are you saved, beloved? 
I mean, are you truly saved? Are you truly forgiven? Are you truly a Christian? Can you truly say here this morning, look what Jesus did for me? I didn't deserve it, but look what Jesus did for me. Now, beloved, notice what he says here, the means of his conversion. Because he wants us to understand this radical moral and spiritual transformation and change he had. Now, beloved, that's what salvation is. It is a moral and spiritual change in the way you're thinking, the way you're acting, the way you're reacting, the way you're interacting. See, something is different. Something supernatural has entered inside of you. It comes from without, not from within. It comes from without, and it goes within. Amen? And then ultimately, it manifests itself without or externally in our life. Now, beloved, I, I, I want you to see this because Paul's saying, these things changed my life. Can you say that? These things changed my life? Pastor, I don't think like I used to think anymore. I, I don't have that same desire that I used to have before. I don't have those cravings that I once had before. You see, God has changed my life. But I want you to notice Paul, what Paul attributes both his new state and standing before God to and also this uh, radical moral and spiritual transformation of his life to. First thing I want you to see under point number two is the means of his conversion. He says it was God's amazing haris, his grace. In other words, beloved, God's divine unmerited favor bestowed upon him who was the undeserving recipient. You see, beloved, it was God's grace that came to him on the Damascus road. It was God's grace that came to Paul, beloved, when he was in that upper room where he was praying and fasting for three days, and then God started enlightening his mind. I can just see him as reflecting back on all the Old Testament prophecies that he knew about the coming of the Messiah, and God him together now like a jigsaw puzzle and he's saying hey it is Jesus who's the Messiah you see beloved it was God's grace that came to him when Ananias came and witnessed to him Ananias God has called you he wants you to serve for him and then he lays his hands on him and scales fall off his eyes beloved he was blind physically but now he could see spiritually amen now for the first time it was God's grace that came to him when he got baptized filled with the Holy Ghost, sealed with the Holy Spirit of the living God. It was God's grace that came to him when God said, I'm going to make you my minister. I'm going to make you my apostle to the Gentiles. You know, I have to tell you, every time I read that, Paul says, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. And Peter was a fisherman. Now, Peter probably did not have, well, not probably, he never had the education Paul had. Now, imagine, if you're going to send anyone to the Jews who are educated, and brought up in the synagogue for 1,500 years. They had the law. You'd think he'd send Paul to them. He says, no. Nope. See, I take the foolish things of the world that confound the wise. Peter, uh-huh. You're going to the Jews. What? <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> and Paul, I'm going to send you to those heathen pagans that don't know one thing, and you're going to talk to them. You're going to have to quote a little bit of uh, philosophy. You're going to have to know a little about and Plato and Aristotle, but I want you to bring them down to the gospel because it is the power of God to save them. See, I want you to do that. And Timothy, I want you to understand what I'm saying to you, that it's the gospel, it's the gospel. You have the power. The Spirit of God is upon you. God will anoint the Word. He will shake them up on the inside until they either bow the knee or they say, oh me, and they walk away. Amen. You see, beloved, he must have shouted, look what the Lord has done for me. Beloved, do you praise the Lord like this for His grace? Grace, grace, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. You know, Paul said, to, and when he wrote to the Ephesians, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, for by grace I saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, before the world ever was, in his plan that we should walk in him. You see, Timothy, there's power in the gospel, there's power with the Spirit, there's power with God's grace. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, I want you to notice in verse 14 that God, that he says that God's grace was exceeding abundant. Hupopleonazo is that phrase. 
and it means it was way beyond measure, uh, much more than he ever needed. Now, Paul must have meditated on that because in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Paul reminds us, he says, hey, hey listen, you, you Christians at Rome, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Amen? No matter what you did, God can forgive you if you repent. That's the key. Repent isn't just believing. There's two different words. The word believe means pistis. That's the Greek word. The word repent is metanoia. That means to do an about face. Okay, so a lot of Christians today with dispensational theology try to redefine the words. But that's not what the Greek says, beloved. And I challenge you always to do what with me. Check me out. Look it up. See if it's true or not. But I want you to notice he not only received grace, beloved, but he also said in verse 16 that he obtained mercy. Eleo was the Greek word, and it means God's divine pity and leniency. God treated him with clemency in his life. God treated him with divine compassion for his awful crimes against heaven, beloved. Now listen, beloved, if God's mercy pardons us, if uh, it's God's mercy that treats us leniently, it's God's mercy that does not punish us according to the punishments that we deserve for our sins, then listen to me, grace is God giving you what you don't deserve, and mercy is God not giving you what you do deserve. People are always crying today, I want justice, I want justice. You want justice when somebody offends you, but you don't want justice before God, you want mercy. How about, I know I do. I don't want justice for what I did. I want mercy for what I did. Now there comes a limit to God's mercy, and God tells us that those who won't repent, and he that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. That's Proverbs 29.1. But the fact of the matter is, if you let the grace of God move in your heart, and your life, and in your mind, it will bring you to repentance, and God will forgive you. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, that was the means of his conversion. I want you to see the manifestation of his conversion in verse 14. He says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. When grace came to Paul like it does to us, beloved, it brings two things. Notice, it brought him, number one, the Bible says faith. Piss this. What do you mean, pastor? The ability to both believe and obey God. That is, now it puts inside of you the desire to want to obey the commandments of God, to obey the moral law of God. If you claim to be born again and you have no desire to do that, beloved, you have not been born again. You have fooled yourself through your own reasoning, foolish reasoning. You see, when you get saved, you don't want to. You cringe at the things that you used to do. You don't go running back into the world and doing those things. Amen? And so that was the uh, uh, pistis that gave him. God gave him faith. Beloved, listen to me. You just don't believe. God gives you the grace to believe. See, salvation is of the Lord, Jonah 2, 9. And so, secondly, beloved, not only to give him faith, pistis, but notice what he said, God gave him agape. In other words, God gave him love. That is a desire and ability. Now, for the first time, to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and finally, to love your neighbor as yourself. Would you say amen out there? You hear me? Jesus said, love to God and man are the two greatest commandments in the Bible. Love to God, love to man. Jesus said love is the fulfilling of the law and the prophets. That's what they were trying to teach you to do, was to love God and love man. Jesus said love sums up both tables of the law, the Ten Commandments, that hang uh, like uh, uh, your ten fingers off your two arms. God says love, love, love. Not love at the expense of everything else, beloved, but if you really love God, you will do what with His commandments? You'll keep them. Why? Not because you just have to, but because you want to. You want to please God. You love God. You understand that the power of God is now unlocked, unloaded, and unlocked in life. And it radically changes you. Amen? Oh, look what the Lord did for me. He says, he, he gave me his grace, and he gave me his faith, and he gave me his love, and he gave me his mercy. And he made this sinner, this sinner, Timothy, into a saint of his. A hagios. Someone who's been separated from a, a, a secular and a profane unto a sacred and to a holy. Therefore, beloved, through faith, Paul now embraced and he preached the religion he once denied and persecuted. 
And through love, he was now able to embrace and endure the Lord and his people whom he once hated and killed. Imagine, beloved, living in Paul's day. Here's Paul with arrest warrants on the way to Damascus. Chains, you can just hear the shackles. How are we going to get those stinkers that are inside the synagogues right now? And Paul gets saved. And you see Paul walking up to the church. Whoa, here he comes. Everybody run for the hills. And Paul's saying, I love you. <laughs> yeah, right. It took Barnabas to come. <laughs> the son of consolation, right? It took Barnabas to persuade them that he really got converted. That he really did love God now. That he really did love Christians now. That he really saw the church as a divine institution. That God himself, whom whom the gates of hell shall never prevail against. Amen? So we saw that, beloved. Listen to me. This is what God's salvation will do for you. It will cause you to believe the things you formerly doubted and to love things you formerly hated. In other words, beloved, salvation will radically change you personally and completely. Salvation will radically change you totally and eternally. And you'll be able to say, hey, hey, mom, dad, my neighbors, look what Jesus did for me. He can do it for you too. Look what he did for me. And he can do it for you too. So that's point number one, beloved, the personal testimony of a sinner. Secondly, uh, it was the pardon of the testimony of the saint. But number three, beloved, I want you to see the placement testimony of a servant. Now, this is important that we understand this. I want you to look at verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, put me into the ministry. Now, beloved, notice that it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself who puts the true minister of God into the ministry. It is the Lord who calls a minister. It is the Lord who commissions a minister. It is the Lord who consecrates a minister, beloved. And this is a critical fact, and we must understand this. Because a lot of people accuse Paul of doing this himself. But that's not true, is it? Or another minister. I know, beloved, I would have never gone into the ministry if God didn't call me. He had to change my heart. I'd have never done it. I'd have never done it. But it took a call from God, and that's what God's in the business of doing. Amen? So Paul did not choose to be a minister or a preacher. Paul didn't choose to be uh, an evangelist or an apostle, beloved, as if it were some profession or career that he sought. The Lord Jesus Christ did it like he does with all true ministers and men of God. And I want you to notice that when Jesus Christ calls a man to preach, he also supernaturally enables him and empowers that man to preach. Now notice the word enabled. Endunumao is that word. It means that Jesus himself supernaturally prepared and equips that man by the gifts and graces of his Holy Spirit. In other words, he is the one who makes a minister out of that man. He is the one that makes a preacher and a teacher out of that man. He is the one that makes a pastor, a shepherd out of that man, an evangelist out of that man, a theologian out of that man. God himself calls that man. God ordains that man, beloved. There's a call that is on the inside, and it's the thing that you want to do the most. You're saying to yourself, this is all I want to do. There's nothing else I want to do in life. One of the qualifications for a pastor is 1 Timothy 3.1. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. The word desire is a Greek word, oregno, almost like the herb. You know what I mean? He who yearns, he who burns, he who longs, who wants to do nothing else but be a pastor, a preacher, then that man has been what? Called by God. He desires the office of a preacher. Amen? Praise the Lord. Listen to me. He may be calling you today. Do you have that kind of burning and yearning in your heart? I didn't. I had the burning and yearning to preach, but not the pastor. God changed my heart. And, beloved, I don't know why. Honestly, and I'm not trying to be self-deprecating or falsely humble. I have no idea why God called me to be a pastor. I didn't want to wipe anybody's noses anymore. I didn't want to be there. They have to be a... You're involved in their marriage, their divorces, their health, their lawsuits, their everything you can imagine. But God changed my heart. God says, you will be a shepherd. And then there's nothing else I wanted to do. And so God put Paul into the ministry, beloved. Now, now listen to me, beloved. I, I want you to see the reasons for this service. Look what he says. 
Why did Jesus call and enable Paul and others like this to be put in the ministry? Paul says, because he counted him faithful. Hagiomai pistos, meaning God foresaw and foreknew the pattern of Paul's former character and life as a Pharisee and a scholar before he was saved. Did you hear that? In other words, beloved, before he was saved, he was dedicated and devoted to once he, what he once believed to be true. Even though he was wrong, he was dedicated and devoted to doing what was wrong because he thought it was right. And God saw him. God said, ha, ha, I can use a man like that. A man that's got a backbone of sand and steel, and he won't bow down the knee to anyone else. I can use that kind of person. Hey, when the going gets tough, he'll stand. When people are in their face, he'll stand. When people are confronting him, he'll stand. When Satan's telling him to quit, he'll stand. I can use a man like that. That's what Paul's saying. He says, he counted me faithful. Hear me now. God sees your daily consecration or lack of it. God sees your daily conduct or commitment or lack of it. God sees it. God sees your daily character or lack of it, beloved, and thereby he calls and enables and entrusts whosoever he sees and finds fit and worthy with a high and holy privilege and power and position in his church and in his kingdom. Now, I'm almost through here. Do you want me to stop? I just ran out of 43 minutes. Do you want me to stop or keep going? All right. We'll have a 10-minute uh, bathroom break right now for you. <laughs> you see, beloved, what I'm saying is this. is He won't call you to do these things if you're an undisciplined person. Can't get out of bed. Can't discipline myself to do this. Can't finish what I start. See, God won't do that. He, he, he's saying he won't call you if you're unfaithful or disloyal. He won't call you if you're untrustworthy. You must be counted faithful. I, I see a lot of unsaved people that are faithful to their job, faithful to their family, faithful to their work, faithful to their sport. They discipline themselves. They orientate themselves. This is what I have to do, and I'm going to do it. I know I feel tired today, but I'm still going to do it. I know that I don't want to get out of bed this morning, but I'm still going to do it. That person is counted what? He's counted faithful. You see, God saw that in Paul. Even though he was an egregious sinner, but he thought he was doing it uh, uh, for God, but it was done ignorantly uh, in unbelief. And the resources for this service, beloved, not only the reason for the service, but they're supernaturally and divinely bestowed upon us. In Ephesians 4.11, the Bible says this, When Christ ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Now listen for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till they all come into the unity of the faith and under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm just kind of paraphrasing that because we've got time right here. My job is to teach you the Word of God. My job is to teach you how to minister. See, my job is to help you be able to exercise that gift that you have so you can glorify God with it. And you can start tomorrow on work day. <laughs> Right, Jimmy? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Dave to keep an eye on you. Somebody better. So, see, God is the one who does this. These are the gifts that he gives them to men. Nobody just makes themselves a shepherd. God says this. Nobody makes himself a teacher. God says, I've given it to you. Uh, see, that's a gift that God has. People think they're just going to teach themselves. Well, who's going to teach you? Who's going to preach to you? Who are you accountable to? Who's going to give you the Lord's table? Who's going to do that? Who's going to disciple you? Who's going to marry you? Who's going to bury you? Who's going to baptize you? Who's going to do it? You think God had this plan in his mind before he gave apostles and pastors and preachers and evangelists and teachers to the church? Of course he did, beloved. Number four, beloved, I want you to see the patent toleration, the patient toleration of the Savior. Look what he says in verses 15 and 16. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. But notice what he says in verse 16. How be it? For this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ may show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now Paul tells us in verse 15 that this is a faithful saying. What in the world does he mean by that? Well, 
Paul's other sayings unfaithful? No, beloved, let me tell you what that saying means. It means this. This is a true message that can be trusted because it came from God. He's saying this is a true mustard, uh, message that should and must be accepted because it was the Lord God, Yehovah himself, who gave it to me. He's saying this is a true message that you can take to the bank that no one must ever ignore or reject. That Christ left the heavenly dimension to come down here to save sinners, fallen sinful men who did not have a chance, a snowball's chance in hell of ever great the doors of God's heaven. And you, if you're not saved today, neither do you. I don't care what your parents are. I don't care what your pastor is. I don't care what church you belong to. If you don't belong to Jesus, you'll never grace the doors of God's heaven. You just won't do it. You see, beloved, what he wants us to see here is the Bible says that Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. And we were lost. The Bible says, beloved, that God so loved the world. You know John 3, 16, so I don't have to quote it for you. That he gave his only begotten son. I, I wouldn't do that, and neither would you. The Bible says, beloved, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the sad fact is, all won't come to repentance. But those who do will be saved. Would you say amen? Also, they'll be saved like me. I want you to notice a couple of things under this point. First is pattern, beloved, in verse 16. He says, I'll be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ may show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now notice the word long suffering. Macrothemia is the Greek word. Macrothemia. And it means patient forbearing. It means that God was long tempered with Paul and he's long tempered with us sinners, beloved. Because he wants to see if we're going to respond to the calling, respond to the grace that he's pouring out upon us, so that we'll repent and we'll get saved. You see, God wanted everyone who had ever known Paul, who had seen him as a blasphemer before, that had seen Paul as a persecutor before, that had seen Paul as a murderer of Christians before, and now has seen Paul as a Christian. God wanted to know that, beloved, that he truly loves and saves even the worst of the worst of sinners like Paul if they'll believe and repent and come to know the Lord as their Savior. Would you say amen out there? Listen to me. You can't have Jesus just as your Savior without having him as your Lord also. And by the way, you need a Savior before you need a Lord. See, you need to get saved first so you can make him Lord of your life. Amen? So Paul says, you all knew me before. You knew what I was like. See, he's trying to show. And, and Timothy, can you imagine the rumors that Timothy ever heard? This is my mentor now. And before this guy, he was a blasphemer, injurious, persecuted, Christians, arrested him, shackled him. And yet he's my mentor. He's my teacher. He's my example. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou in the faithful who shall be able to teach others also. Blubber wiggle. Lord willing, God's going to raise up preachers here. And you know what? I'm trying to pass the baton on to them. To the things that thou hast heard of me amongst many witnesses, the same commit thou to what? Faithful men. God counted me faithful, Paul said. And so they can pass it on and pass it on and pass it on and pass it on and perpetuate the church of the Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. Would you say amen? Bless God. And he's coming again. Amen. So he says, he was long-suffering to me. Now Paul says, notice the word there he uses in verse 16, pattern. He may use me as a pattern. Hupotuposis. And it means that Paul was God's sketch and showpiece. Paul was God's specimen and outline, his model and chief example of how God can and will save even the worst and most notorious and heinous of sinners like Paul. Paul's saying, listen to me, if he'll do it to me, man, you can't even compare to what I used to. It was my mission in life to persecute Christ, to blaspheme Christ, to kill his people. Did you do that? Well, well, well no, I, I, I may have killed some. Did you kill Christians who were indwelt by the Holy Ghost? Well, 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 and yet God saved me. Hey. Don't you listen to those Judaizers. You listen to me. You listen to the gospel. The gospel can save them. The gospel can sanctify them. The gospel can change them. The gospel can transform them. 
Listen to me, Timothy. I know, I know, I know what I am talking about. Would you say amen out there? So that's his pattern. Notice his promise, beloved. Verse 16. Notice that God will not only save their souls, He'll give them the saving and sanctifying grace to help them to believe throughout the course of their lives until they enter in to the kingdom of heaven and receive everlasting life. Paul's saying this, Timothy, my life is a showpiece of how God saved me. He has put me on display before all of you for His glory. So no matter what they did, remember what I did so you can tell them. And so they'll know, I don't care if you were a harlot, he'll save you. I don't care if you were a murderer, he'll save you. I don't care if you were a pathological liar, he'll save you. I don't care if you were a drunk or a drug addict, he'll save you. Look what he did for me. Look what Jesus did for me. Would you say amen? Glory to God. Look what he did for me. I want you to look at me. You see, he radically changed for my life. He made me a living trophy, and he'll do it for you, by the way. So Paul's saying, if God can forgive me and radically change me from an adversary to an apostle, if God could take me, who was a persecutor, and make me a preacher, if God could take me, who was an executor of Christians, and make me an evangelist, oh my goodness, he have no problem dealing with you. You'll be able to say, look what Jesus did for me too. Just like I'm saying, amen. You see, beloved, there's hope and help for you too. And lastly, let me close with number five, the praiseful testimony of the sovereign. When Paul thought about this, look what he says in verse 17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. When Paul thought of what he was before Jesus found him, when Paul thought of everything that Jesus forgave him for, when Paul thought of all that the Lord Jesus Christ had done in him and with him and through him as an apostle and minister, beloved, he could not hold back this anthem of praise and admiration for God. Thinking of this uh, so great and glorious salvation led Paul here to break out in a grand doxology to God. See, now, beloved, he's so full of it, so full of God's grace, gratitude, love, mercy, that he just wants to praise the Lord. It is good to sing praises unto the Lord, the Bible says. Amen? And so Paul gives a grand doxology, but I want you to notice the descriptive terms he uses to praise and exalt and extol God's mighty and majestic attributes to honor and glorify Him. He calls Christ, number one, the King Eternal. You see, I had all kinds of other ideas, but Jesus Christ himself is the King Eternal, the sovereign and supreme King and ruler, alone rules and reigns ad infinitum throughout the universe, throughout the ages or endless ages and eons of time. There was never a time when Jesus Christ did not pre-exist. He is the King Eternal, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Secondly, but I want you to know, he calls, uh, wait a minute, before I go a little farther. I remember the Lord, in, in the book of Jeremiah, no, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Do you know that Jeremiah preached 20 years before God finally brought the judgments? Now, can you imagine all the false prophets are saying, God's going to bless you, God's going to do this, God's going to do this. Well, you know it, beloved. Just read Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah preached 20 years. And he's saying, Lord, they're mocking me. Look, you haven't brought the judgments yet. They're thinking they've got food on the table. But 20 years later, guess what? Nebuchadnezzar came in. And everything that uh, Jeremiah had prophesied came to pass. Now, they were looking at King Zedekiah of Israel, King Jed- uh, Jedediah. Oh, these are our king. They're going to deliver us. They're going to make a treaty with Egypt. Jeremiah says, uh-uh. There's only a king eternal. And he said this in Jeremiah 10.10. 10. He said, but the Lord is the true God. He is the everlasting king. The Lord is, not King Zedekiah, not King Jedediah. The Lord is, not Pharaoh Necho down there in Egypt. He's a nobody and nothing in God's sight. The Bible says in Psalm 90 in verse 2, Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Would you say amen? Under the king eternal. 
Paul could indeed say, praise the Lord. Look what Jesus did for me. Why? Because before his conversion, beloved, he had seen Jesus as just another messianic imposter. But now as a Christian, he saw Jesus as the infinite and eternal God. And now said of Jesus in Colossians 2.9, this is what he said, that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now Paul would have never said that until he got saved, amen? In him, in that man that walked on this earth, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the most blessed Holy Trinity in the universe. Co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent, co-essential, uh, substantial. In Him, God dwells. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Would you say amen out there? You see, he's saying that you listen. I didn't know this before, but he is the Theanthropos. I understand now. When David said to my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's Psalm 110.1. I understand now that he's talking about a theanthropos, a God-man, fully deity, fully humanity, deity enshrined, enshrouded, enshrined in humanity, fully God, fully man, without confusing the substance. Now I understand that. I did it before, but look what God did for me now. He opened up the eyes of my understanding. And I understand about God of very God, light of very light, truth of very truth, whom Jesus really is. So he's the king eternal who came to save his subjects so they too could say, look what Jesus did for me. Not only that, beloved, he calls Christ immortal. Uh, That is, he is morally and spiritually and physically incorruptible, meaning he's not subject to any form of deception or decay and death, beloved. He alone is inherently and innately endless and ageless and ceaseless. We don't have time to go there, but in 1 Timothy 6.16, in the same book, he says, Who only hath immortality dwelling in the light? In 2 Timothy 1.10, Paul says that Christ had brought death and, and immortality to light through the gospel. You and I are not inherently immortal. See, immortality is quality of life. Eternality is quantity of life. Immorality, uh, uh, immorality. immortality, beloved, is you living in a resurrected, glorified, transformed form body fashioned like unto Christ's glorious body, according to the working whereby he's evil and able to subdue all things unto himself. That's Philippians 3, 20, 21. But see, he says, I understand it now that Jesus himself, he is immortal. But you know what? Paul says to the church of Corinth, someday we're going to be like him. Someday we're going to be incorruptible when we receive this resurrected and glorified body, when we're given a new body. In 1 Corinthians 15, 53 and following, Paul says this, For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Or must put on immortality. So when this corruption is put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying of Isaiah that says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death! Where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, who giveth us up the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Come on and say amen out there. Look what Jesus did for me. Not only that, beloved, Paul's saying, we too, in an antiphonal response, someday before the angels, beloved, before the whole universe. Gabriel! Huh? My body shines more than yours. Huh? Look at that. <laughs> I look like Jesus. You don't. Those six wings of yours. I don't look like that. You have feathers flopping all over the place. I don't have any feathers. <laughs> I'm only playing with you now. And lastly, beloved, he says, the only wise God. Now, can you see Paul in his doxology? Oh, under the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Oh, God. Oh, God. When I think of you, I shovel my timbers here. <laughs> the only wise God. What do you mean by that? 
He's saying that God is the only divine being in the universe who is omniscient and possesses perfect and infinite wisdom and intelligence, and that he knows how to redeem and regenerate fallen, dirty, stinking sinners and make them righteous. Look what the Lord has done for me. He's a wise God. Who'd ever thought by a gospel, simple words, anointed by the Holy Ghost, because we didn't know it then, anointed by God's grace, but we didn't know it then, would so change your life. Oh, we're sitting here this morning under the ministration of the Word of God. Let it go into your mind. Let it slip into your soul. Let it cleanse your spirit. Let it change your heart. Let it change your life. Let it do it. So you can say, look what Jesus did for me. You didn't just come here to look at me. Did you? <laughs> you see, beloved, we can all say, look what Jesus did for me. I was a sinner, but now he made me a saint. Look what Jesus did for me. I was a drunk, and he made me a disciple. I was a hellion, and he made me holy. Look what Jesus did for me. I was a fornicator, but now he made me a follower. I was a, a rebel, and now he made me righteous. I was godless, and now he made me godly. Look what Jesus did for me. I was an immoral person, but now I am a moral person. Look what Jesus did for me. And we can all say like Paul did here, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The old spiritual, Negro spiritual. We should really get into it. I remember reading one time, in a jail cell, right, these, uh, there was a black man in one cell, and then there was a heating duct that went over to another cell. And the old black man started saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And the white guy picked it up on the other side. And he said, Amen, let me hear you talking. I started singing in unison. Amen, Amen, Amen. Come on, speak and do me now. Amen. <laughs> He was in there and himself a low down, hold down, show down in that prison. Now Paul concludes this psychology by saying, Amen. In other words, will you agree with that? Will you assent to those truths? You see, God changed my life and God changed my eternal destiny. And he'll do it the same for you, Timothy. He'll do the same for you, Tom. He'll do the same for you, Joel, Derek. The same for you sitting here today, and you'll say, look what Jesus did for me.